Today, friends, we welcome you to worship at St. Matthew United Methodist Church, and uh, I want to give thanks on this Easter Sunday, 2013, for all of these um, uh, folks back here who are providing this glorious music. We have our brass uh, quintet. Uh, let me count them, one, two, three, four, five. We have this brass quintet, I think that's the name for it, and, uh, and they're just absolutely uh, fantastic. It includes our own uh, John Bell, and uh, most of the other people are from TCU, otherwise they wouldn't let him in, uh, he and Tanner. Uh, ever, who is from TCU and who's not? Uh, all of them. Oh, you're, you're, you're not from TCU. Oh, well, they let one ringer in here, but she sure can play that horn. Uh, and we got, our, we got our, our helpers in the choir. We so appreciate you. They've been through, with us through these special services, and you are a blessing to us, and we give, we give thanks for you. And we have guests here this morning. I ask all of you to please uh, sign your sign-in slips and put your name and address on there and your email if you would like to perhaps get the church letter from people. You don't have to get the church letter, but we're going to be sending that out through email in a couple of weeks. And uh, if you would like to know what's going on here with our concerts and other things, you have a chance to do that. You probably heard this, uh, and just put that in the offering plate along with your gift this morning when the, when the plates, are, plates are passed. Just put that sign and slip in there. You probably heard this sad story before. A young woman named Janet, she was, sitting at the, she was at the kitchen sink working when her dog came in, and he was carrying in his mouth the neighbor's beautiful white rabbit. And she thought, oh my Lord, life has ended for us on this street because the little nine-year-old girl who lived next door, that rabbit was the pride of her life. She said, what in the world are we gonna do? Her husband came in for lunch and uh, they, they, they had this uh, plot uh, to, between the two of them. They took that rabbit and they gave it a bath, got all the dirt off of it because the dog had evidently been dragging it around in the yard and they washed that baby up and they, uh, they took it and uh, they, they uh, uh, blow dried it and they got it all fluffy looking and it looked as good as new except it was dead. And so they uh, took the rabbit and they sneaked into the neighbor's backyard and they put the rabbit back in the neighbor's cage and they made sure that it was locked nicely and, uh, you know, what would the neighbors know? They would probably think the rabbit had died of old age since it was quite an old rabbit. Well, the neighbors got in that evening and uh, they knew they were going to get a report on the rabbit and sure enough, there was a knock at the door and there stood the whole family, the mother and father and, and the nine-year-old kid. And they said, you will not believe what has happened. They said, what has happened? They said, well, listen, our old rabbit died of old age. And yesterday, we buried it in the backyard. <laughs> and today, it appeared back in the cage, looking like it had been to the beauty parlor. <laughs> well, children, that ain't no resurrection. And sometimes when the resurrection is preached on Easter Sunday morning, Folks don't manage to get that boy out of that tomb. But let me tell you, he is risen. And he is risen then, he is risen now. I, I, I love to go to the Gospel of John on this Sunday because John takes us, he, he takes us right into the tomb. And I want to talk to you today about the, the understanding that when God does something, it is perfect. I've studied religious experiences for a number of years. Uh, that not yet published book on religious experiences that I've done uh, is filled with a, with a hundred of them, but I probably know, have, have, have read 2,000, and in all of them there is a kind of perfection. In every experience of God, there is a kind of perfection about everything that God does. And the crucifixion story, some people say it's too good to be true, actually it is good because it is true. And this, the, the resurrection story partakes of that same kind of infinite and meticulous and beautiful perfection. Everything was as it had to be to witness to the gospel. God knows how to do a show. God knows how to do show and tell. Some people say, well, why was the stone rolled away? Because even the tomb itself was a setup. Everything had happened exactly as it had to happen. Most, most people who were crucified were thrown into a common grave. That could not happen to Jesus if we were going to have the resurrection. He was not thrown into a common grave. 
the, uh, that wonderful man, Joseph Arimathea, who had a lot of money and was able to buy a 14-foot piece of linen cloth, uh, which is now the Shroud of Turin. Uh, we still have the cloth around. Uh, the Gospels can only mention the cloth. And it was wrapped over and under the body of Jesus. He had a tomb in which uh, no one had ever been buried before. This, uh, this wealthy man who was a follower of Jesus provided all of these things for the disciples. The women could not finish their work on Good Friday because the sun was going down and they had to clear out of there and be back in their homes by sundown. Nobody could be out on the streets doing anything after sundown. It is very important in God's plan, in God's scenario, that the body not be washed, not be anointed, not be touched, but simply being covered across and under with this 14 piece of, foot, foot piece of cloth. When the women got there that morning, they saw the, t the stone rolled away, they saw the tomb was empty, and they ran back and told the other disciples, two of them were brave enough to come out, all of them were hiding in the upper room for fear that the re religious authorities would do to them what they had done to Jesus. And there were two of them uh, bold enough to run to the tomb and look along with Mary Magdalene and several other women, most of them it seems, who, who were named uh, Mary. Uh, one of them, I, I believe we know, was, uh, was the mother of Jesus. She wouldn't have, was the aunt of Jesus. Uh, and uh, uh, her name would not have been Mary, but there are a lot of Marys in this story. They ran to the tomb. The, the younger disciple, the beloved disciple, got there first. We think that's John. He doesn't name himself. Got there first, but Peter comes in second, but he rushes into the tomb. John holds back. But as soon as they look at the scene inside the tomb, Peter's still bewildered. John believes such was the empty tomb, so powerful, so perfect was the witness of the tomb itself that you could look at it and believe in the resurrection, even without all that was to come after that. God leaves no strings untied. He leaves nothing dangling. And the truth is, God has given us enough evidence for any reasonable person to look at that evidence and believe that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Young John looked in and he believed. One of the things that they saw there was the way in which the burial cloth provided by Joseph of Arimathea, would have been lying. The evidence from the Shroud of Turin, by the way, I hope you've been keeping up with it. You can't depend on me always to just tell you it's authentic. Through thick and thin, through report after report, I've already told you that I believe it is authentic. Nobody in the Middle Ages could fake this baby. It is too powerful. It is too particular. It is too advanced. It has on it the, the image of our Lord front and back. Recent studies have indicated from Italy, we get a, a book that's coming out soon. It's in Italian now. It'll be translated into English that tells us the most recent study and the dating of the fibers has put at the time of Jesus Christ. The carbon-14 dating that was done a few years ago was done on a corner of the shroud that the late Ray Rogers has pointed out was a medieval repair, and it mixed fibers from the medieval with the older fibers. That shroud lay there, and the indication on that image is that as the body disappeared from that tomb, now, I hope when you think about the resurrection, you don't think about a resuscitated corpse. I hope you don't think about that rabbit also that's been fur dried and propped up. Uh, God invented quantum physics and he could do it a long time before anybody knew anything about it. The resurrection was a quantum physics event. The evidence from the shroud is that in the moment of resurrection, Jesus disappeared from that cloth. And the cloth evidently fell down in the moment of resurrection, fell down through the body, and it actually recorded on the cloth x-ray images 
of the gums and the bony sockets for the teeth and x-ray images of the bones in the hands because the cloth was falling through the body. That would have been the world's first x-ray. It was also the world's first photograph of sorts because it provides a post-mortem analysis of the crucifixion showing every wound that our Lord suffered on the cross. And it also speaks of the resurrection because only a resurrection could produce the image. And they would have seen it. And at that time, the shroud had not darkened with age. The image would have been amazingly bright. An image of the one they loved on that piece of cloth. And then came the appearances. That was not enough for God. It is not enough to know that he is raised. There's something else they have to know. And he has to tell them personally. I am with you always. And you are safe. This is the way life works. This is the way death works. And if you don't think you need the resurrection story, and if you don't think you need Jesus Christ, then you must be pretty young and you have never lost anybody in your life that you dearly love. For the moment you lose someone that you love, there's nothing that you need more than God, and then you will know it. And there's nothing more that you will need to know than that that person is alive and safe and well and going on with their life by the power of Jesus Christ and because of what God has done to death. It was about two weeks ago that an older gentleman came into my office and he wanted to tell me a story. Someone knowing of my interest in religious experiences had sent him to me because they wanted him to get his story validated. His name is Ken and he's a very distinguished, uh, very likable gentleman. He's in the real estate business. He works with people a lot. He's very ingratiating. But he was also suffering tremendously because his wife of 59 years had passed away two weeks before and he was still in the throes of suffering. He was here on Good Friday. He knew I was going to tell his story this morning. He was here on Good Friday and he brought a big picture with him of uh, his wife, Nita, because he wanted uh, me to see the woman that I was talking about this morning. He said he had an unusual story to tell me and he wanted me to see what I thought about it. He had been a bit angry with God before his wife's death. She had a stroke two years ago. She was left incapacitated on one side. They had to use a lift to get her out of the bed and back in the bed every day, and he cared for her all day long, and round the clock. And they had a wonderful life together. And she kept her smile and she kept her spirit right up until the day she died. But the truth is, when she did die, rather than being healed as he had asked God for God to do. The day she did die, he was feeling a bit angry that God had let her leave, let her go through this time when she could not walk, when she could not move one side of her body. But he had that feeling for only a few hours because after about three hours, he got a call from a friend of theirs named Angie, who they didn't see all that often, but she always kept them in her prayers. We talk about the appearances of our Lord. I want you to know that those appearances of our Lord are the first fruits of all kinds of appearances. I want you to know that we are not far from heaven. I want you to know that heaven is real. I want you to know that the resurrection is about something. It's about you and it's about me. When our Lord lifted up on high, he lifted us with him. Angie called Ken and said, is Nita still alive? Called him out of the blue. 
He hadn't had time to call her and tell her that, uh, that Nita had passed. I'll read the story to you. I replied, no, Angie, Nita passed only a few minutes ago. Well, I knew she is dead, replied Angie. I just talked to her. I lay down for just a few minutes about an hour ago, and Nita came to me just as I awoke. She told me that she had some messages and that I should call and give them to you right now. She was so beautiful. Wearing a beautiful blue chiffon dress, she looked about 40 years old. Her complexion was perfect, kind of like a porcelain doll. And her smile was that same lovely smile she always had. She stood with both arms out and she looked to be barefooted, standing on what looked like grass, and there were beautiful flowers all around her, and the sky like her dress was the bluest I have ever seen. There seemed to be mountains behind her, and I was seeing her through something like the frame of a door, but there was no door. She said, I want you to take a message to Ken for me. Now I want you to listen carefully to this message. Because the essence of this message is the essence of the gospel. Nita had been in heaven only a few minutes, and already she knew the fullness of that gospel which Jesus proclaimed, and it is the heart of what she wanted delivered to Ken. I want you to tell him that I am fine that everything is okay now. I'm well. I have arrived here with no pain. Tell Ken I can move both hands and both legs. I talk. I walk. I rejoice in the Lord. Tell him to give my stuff away to someone who can use it. I don't need it now. Tell him to pray more for Dan and Sherry and Carrie. Well, that was the three grandkids. Angie had never heard of the third grandkid and asked her who it was. She was talking about someone she didn't even know. Tell Ken to love more. Tell him to forgive those who have done wrong to our family and to us. Tell him I love him very much and I will be waiting for him. Angie said, I started to move toward her, but Nita held up both hands to me. I remember thinking that if I went any further, I might die too. She thanked me for listening to her, and then she was gone, and I got up immediately to do what she had asked me to do. Those appearances of our Lord sound strange to a lot of people. They should not. Heaven isn't that far away. Everything is exactly as Jesus said it was. Therefore, I think you and I ought to do exactly as he called on us to do, to love, to forgive. Now, there was a difference between Ken's wife, Nita, in her glorified body her spiritual body, as Paul called it, and our Lord's glorified body. Because when our Lord appeared to the disciples, he was not perfect. He said to the disciples, you know it's me. He said to Thomas, put your finger in the wound in my hand and put your hand in the wound in my side. He carries those for us. It's our mark upon him. And even that is perfect. For only a perfect love for imperfect people would leave such abiding wounds. Doesn't it 
make you want to give thanks for what we have now and forever through Jesus Christ our Lord who loved us enough to give himself that we might know whatever we're going through we are safe in God's grace. So keep on living, keep on giving thanks, and keep on loving, and keep on forgiving in his name. Join me in prayer. God of grace and glory, we are before you now. You have laid your claim upon us. You have given us a perfect witness to the power of your grace and the power of your love for us. In this moment now, Lord, let us receive you anew. And from this moment forward, we ask that you grow in our lives, intervene, meddle, do what you need to do to make us look, to make us listen, to make us love, to make us rejoice, to make us over in the image you would have us be. Amen.